Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. We'll give everyone a minute to join. Um, for, for those attendees that are out there, can you can you see uh, can you see me? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning if you're in New Zealand. Thank you for joining us for Astarte Medical's webinar presented by Dr. Jane Harding, Dr. Jane Osweiler, and Dr. Chris McKinley on updates in management of neonatal hypoglycemia. I'm Tammy Jansen, co-founder and CFO of Astarte Medical. For those of you who don't know us, Astarte Medical is a precision nutrition company providing digital solutions to support nutrition and feeding practices for preterm infants in the NICU. We've been hosting a series of educational webinars, all focused on the growth and development of preterm infants and the importance of feeding, nutrition, and gut health. This is a look at our past webinars. You can view any of them on demand by visiting our website at astartemedical.com. This is a look at our lineup of upcoming speakers. You can also find the details for these upcoming webinars on our website. Please join us for our next webinar on July 8th for a presentation by Dr. Sudarshan Jadshirla from Nationwide Children's Hospital on taking a closer look at improving neonatal feed feeding difficulties from mechanisms to process. Watch for the invitation to this informative webinar in your inbox. I'm now pleased to introduce our esteemed presenters. Jane Harding is a University of Auckland Distinguished Professor and a researcher in the Life Path Research Group of the University's Ligons Institute. Professor Harding practiced as specialist neonatologist at Na National Women's Hospital Auckland and has been Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Auckland. Her ongoing research concerns the role of nutrition and growth factors in the regulation of growth before and after birth, blood glucose regulation in the newborn, and the long-term consequences of treatments given around the time of birth. Jane Allsweiler is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Child and Youth Health, University of Auckland, and works clinically as a neonatal pediatrician in the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Auckland City Hospital. She is the chair of the Perinatal Society of Australia and New Zealand Policy Committee and the neonatal representative on that board. Her current research in interests focus on neonatal glucose homeostasis and growth, including long-term consequences of hypo and hyperglycemia and late preterm birth. Chris McKinley is a neonatologist at Kids First Hospital, Counties Manukau, and senior lecturer in perinatal health, Ligons Institute, University of Auckland. His research focuses on early life interventions for improving long-term metabolic, neurodevelopmental, and respiratory health outcomes of at-risk infants. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to post your questions at any time throughout the presentation in the chat box on the right side of your screen. I'll now turn it over to you, Chris. Tammy, can you hear me? I was not able to hear your presentation. Tammy, do you want me to go ahead? <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't hear the presentation. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, my name is Chris McKinley. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the first two of our objectives in this webinar, which is to talk about pathophysiology um, and then long-term effects of neonatal hyperglycemia on neurodevelopment. My colleague Jane Oswella will talk about um, screening and management, and Jane Harding uh, will finish with looking at prevention. So the first question that we need to address is, what is the problem um, of neonatal hyperglycemia and what are we treating? And that's very important to understand before we get into clinical management. Much of the discourse about neonatal hyperglycemia is focused on trying to establish the correct threshold for diagnosis. But I think it's implausible that there would be a single number that could apply to each infant in each situation. And anything that we choose as an operational threshold will involve trade-offs between benefits, harms and costs. And we'll talk about this later. Um, and this is because there's a very indirect relationship between hyperglycemia and neuroglycopenia, uh, the effect on the brain, and an even less direct relationship with clinical outcomes that matter long term. And the basic problem, if we think of the um, analogy of screening and diagnosis, is that a blood glucose really is a screening test. And the problem is that we don't yet have a test uh, to make a clear diagnosis. I've illustrated this further in this schema here. And in the, the middle box here uh, represents neuroglycopenia. And this is the basic physiological problem um, that we're trying to prevent and then indeed treat if it occurs. And neuroglycopenia is not simply low brain, brain glucose. But it's a state of low glycolysis in neurons that ultimately leads uh, not simply to energy deficit, but an imbalance of metabolism in the cell. And there's two key candidate hypotheses about how uh, neurons would be injured and eventually die. And the most prominent one is an excitotoxicity theory. And what happens when glycolysis is low in a neuron is that aspartate builds up. Uh, there's a disturbance in the flux through the Krebs cycle and aspartate builds up in the cytosol and then spills out of the neuron and actually acts as an as a excitatory neurotransmitter. And so neurons get a state of exocytosity. There's also the possibility of oxidative stress, and I'll come back to talk about this. There are a whole lot of factors that influence this physiological flow from blood glucose through to neuroglycopenia and then ultimately to cognitive effects if that should occur. Um, in terms of the blood glucose, we only take usually intermittent testing, but we have very limited information on what's going on between those um, intermittent tests. There are many factors that affect the uptake of glucose from plasma into the brain, um, the expression of the, the glut, receptor, glut receptors in the brain and neurons. Um, blood glucose and stability itself can affect how glucose is taken up into the brain. And there are complex interactions between astrocytes and, and neurons. We know um, in terms of the energy state in the brain that babies have low ketones in the early newborn period, and I'll talk about that. And it may also be uh, true that um, different aspects of treatment may add to oxidative stress. In terms of the long-term outcome, if there is neurological injury, there are multiple factors that can influence outcome for a child from birth through to um, late, later childhood. Um, there may be other perinatal insults, and there is significant plasticity and remodeling that occurs in the brain. And of course, the child's postnatal environment may influence outcome. One um, factor that we need to consider is that neural, neuronal injury may be ongoing even after correction of a blood glucose. And there is considerable animal evidence for this hypothesis of glucose reperfusion injury. Um, firstly, um, it's been shown that reactive oxygen species increase in the immature brain after um, uh, glucose reperfusion, after hyperglycemia. Um, it's also been shown that if glucose levels are too high after an episode of hyperglycemia, that there's overactivation of PARP1, which is a DNA repair enzyme. But when overactivated, this can actually initiate um, necrotic cell death. And it's also been shown in some animal studies that if you treat hyperglycemia with ketones rather than dextrose, uh, you, you reduce the risk of neuronal cell death. We became interested in this phenomenon when we made this observation several years ago. 
Uh, these data are from the CHILD study, which is a large prospective um, study of infants born at risk of hyperglycemia. Um, approximately half of the infants did develop hyperglycemia, and most importantly, three quarters of them had continuous interstitial glucose monitoring for the first 48 hours. So we were able to accurately profile their uh, glycemic status. These children were all followed up at two years of age with a detailed uh, Bailey and paediatric assessment. And what we found was surprisingly, um, neonatal hyperglycemia itself wasn't associated with outcome, but among the children who did have hyperglycemia, those who had impairment had higher glucose profiles uh, in the early newborn period, as demonstrated here by the red line. This red line shows the children that had neurosensory impairment. The blue line is the children that were normal. And this difference in early glucose profile became much more evident when we looked at the children who had hyperglycemia and were treated with dextrose. And those that went on to have impairment at two had a much uh, higher spike in their initial glucose uh, concentrations. We went on to assess these children in detail at four and a half years of age. And we made another observation, which is also interesting and um, somewhat concerning. We looked at all of the uh, episodes of hyperglycemia over a six hour period using a continuous interstitial trace. And we divided the children into two tiles of uh, glycemic uh, parameters, including the time that it took to reach the maximum glucose over that six hour period after the episode and other parameters, average, maximum, minimum, et cetera, shown here. And when we divided the children into two tiles for time to reach the maximum glucose, what we found was very much the Goldilocks principle. So those children that had a um, very slow uh, recovery of their glucose had a higher risk of neurosensory impairment to those that were in the middle, the reference group. But those that had a more rapid increase in their glucose also were at higher risk uh, of neurosensory impairment, suggesting that delayed recovery is bad, but also potentially rapid recovery may have the same effect. To, to understand how we might treat hyperglycemia, we need to understand why babies get low blood glucose. And I think the, the simplest way of explaining this is that it's a state persisting fetal metabolism. The baby has failed to transition normally after birth. During fetal life, insulin is a key growth hormone. It promotes IGF-1 and directly protein anabolism and fat deposition. And importantly, the fetus uh, has a continuous supply of glucose from the mother. So therefore, it secretes lots of insulin. It has a low set point for suppressing insulin secretion uh, because it's not worried about fasting cycles. At birth, for the baby to survive, the baby needs to initiate gluconeogenesis, so producing glucose from the liver and making ketones in the liver. And to do this, it needs to break down fat to provide glycerol um, for glucose synthesis and fatty acids for ketones. And of course, all of these are inhibited by insulin. Um, so for these processes to occur, the, the beta cell and the, the newborn pancreas has to undergo rapid adaptation. And this most importantly involves increasing the set point for insulin secretion. The beta cell must cope with fasting and bolus cycles. And importantly, insulin switches from regulating growth to controlling uh, glucose output from the liver. So babies that have a problem with their glucose have what I uh, term impaired metabolic transition. Um, so the beta cell has failed to adapt sufficiently during those first hours after birth. The two common babies we see with hyperglycemia are the large babies, LGA, and also smaller growth-restricted babies. And although they have different mechanisms, the, the end physiology is similar. So in large babies, it's thought that they have beta cell hypertrophy and hyperplasia uh, from, from chronic excess glucose supply and stimulation. In the growth-restricted baby, they are exposed to chronic hypoxia, and this drives a noradrenaline response which suppresses insulin secretion in utero, but after birth, there's a reactive increase in insulin secretion. Uh, the net problem for these babies is that they fail to suppress insulin at low glucose concentrations, and this decreases their glucose output and also providing substrates from fat. Uh, 
We became more aware of this problem when this study was done from the from child uh, participants. This um, these data are admission metabolite bloods uh, for babies in the first 48 hours who were admitted to NICU after persisting hyperglycemia. Each of these bars represents one individual baby. Um, the, the numbers below the bar show their postnatal age uh, at the time of collection of bloods, and they've been organised according to their, their feeding pattern, breast, combined, or not fed. And the thing that I want you to focus on is the dark black part of the bar, which represents beta-hydroxybutyrate ketones. And as you can see, the ketones are extremely low to, to not detectable. Um, we replicated these findings in another study where we looked at babies who were admitted with hyperglycemia and, and required ongoing treatment after 72 hours. Um, and again, 93% of these babies had undetectable ketones. We also looked at insulin, and the important point I think here is that the insulin is not uh, super high, but it's inappropriately high for the glucose level. And we, we looked at the ratio in terms of units to mole. Uh, insulin was about five times that of glucose. Um, so this represents a, um, a state of uh, high insulin secretion um, and low alternative fuels. And this is vastly different to healthy breastfed infants who um, do produce ketones on the first day and progressively so over the first um, 48 hours of life. So I think in, um, in, in summary, um, neonatal hyperglycemia represents a state of persisting fetal metabolism and the babies that we're interested in need to treat have a state of impaired metabolic transition. And if we're to make progress in terms of improving outcomes of treatment, then I think we need to think about a more physiologically based approach. And for me, the four key areas that we need to focus on in terms of research going forward is to develop treatments that actually target the underlying pathophysiology, not just correcting low blood glucose. We need to understand the effects of treatment on neuronal function and be aware that treatment may actually contribute to ongoing injury. We need to have better we need to identify markers for neuroglycopenia, which we currently don't have, and we need to develop broader diagnostic criteria for those babies that have true impaired metabolic transition. So in the last few minutes of this section of the talk, I'm going to talk about what do we know about the clinical outcomes. And given everything that I've said, it's not surprising that it's very difficult to understand the relationship between hyperglycemic episodes and long-term neurodevelopment. Nevertheless, we did, in 2019, um, publish the first meta-analysis of studies that looked at the relationship between uh, long-term neurodevelopmental outcome and episodes of hyperglycemia, comparing those babies to other babies who had similar risk factors but were not exposed to hyperglycemia. And I think the striking thing is, from our systematic review, despite the prevalence and importance of this problem, we could only find 11 studies that met eligibility criteria. You can, uh, these are shown here, and, I, and what is not surprising is that those from the 70s uh, had very low thresholds for diagnosis, whereas those over the last decades uh, used a definition that would be more consistent with practice today of around 2.6 millimoles. Most of the early studies uh, were, had high risk of bias or uncertain risk of bias. Uh, whereas the more recent studies were of higher quality. We divided uh, the outcomes from these studies into two epochs. The first was early childhood, two to five years of age. Amongst uh, six studies, we found no overall association with neonatal hyperglycemia and uh, composite neurodevelopmental impairment. What we did find is that there were adverse effects on specific cognitive functions, particularly visual motor function and executive function, which is the higher functions that a child needs to regulate their behaviour and to learn, so attention, memory, problem solving, etc. We did not see associations with general cognitive function, epilepsy or language. And by mid-childhood, there were, there were few data available. Um, in, in a very small set of studies, there was an association with impairment. Um, these were high-risk of bias. And there was one study that looked at school uh, 
a small but increased risk of low educational achievement, both in language and numeracy. Most of the data come from, from two studies. One is our study, the child study, which I've talked about. And I think what was important about findings at four and a half years of age is that we did find a dose response. So this, um, these data show uh, neurosensory impairment, visual motor difficulty, and executive function uh, risk um, by the severity of the glucose. And you can see here that those children who are most at risk of these problems had severe glucose, which we defined less than two. Um, we also looked at the frequency of the episodes and saw a very similar pattern. So for visual motor function, those children who were most at risk had three or more episodes. Um, and similar patterns were seen for executive function. What was interesting, because we had the interstitial monitors, we could also look at children who had episodes on the monitor, but not clinically by blood glucose. And these children had a much higher risk, uh, a fourfold risk of executive um, dysfunction. This other study, which I think is important to be aware of, is from Jeff Kaiser from Arkansas. And this is a, a different study from all the others in that it looked at blood glucose concentrations in a general population. Uh, at this institution, all babies had an initial blood glucose screen. Um, and then if their subsequent blood glucose was normal, there was no further screening. And what they found in babies who had one episode of blood glucose, which then normalized, is that they had lower um, achievement rates at school age um, up 10, at 10 years of age. And, and this was associated with blood glucose that's less than 2.5 millimoles or 45 milligrams per deciliter, as well as 2.2 and 2. So the, the, it's certainly true that we see associations between hypoglycemia and adverse cognitive outcomes. There are specific cognitive outcomes. We can't entirely exclude the problem of confounding. And I think it's my conclusion is that there is um, risks adverse neurodevelopmental outcome, but it's very difficult to tell simply from blood glucose which children are going on to have problems. So I'm now going to hand over to Jane Osweiler, who's going to talk to you about screening and treatment of hyperglycemia. Thanks, Chris, and good morning, everybody. I'll just put out my slides. So as Chris said, I'm going to talk about how we screen babies for neonatal hypoglycemia. And then once we've found neonatal hypoglycemia, how we treat it. And I'm going to look at the various treatment options. So treatment options that involve the baby staying with the mother. So um, having breast milk, dextrose gel or formula, and treatment options if those have failed and the baby's admitted to NICU. So these are the babies that we consider to be at risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. They include babies who are born preterm, babies who are growth restricted, babies of diabetic mothers, and babies who are large for gestational age. And when we screen these babies using an accurate glucose oxidase method of analyzing blood glucose concentration, we find that about half of them will actually develop neonatal hypoglycemia with preterm and small babies being at the higher end of the risk and larger babies um, at the lower end, but all about 50%. To put that in context, um, Deb Harris did a study that was published last year, the GLOW study, looking at babies who weren't at risk for neonatal hypoglycemia. So their mothers didn't have diabetes, they were born at an appropriate weight for gestational age, and they were born at term. And she measured both their interstitial and plasma glucose concentrations over the first five days. You can see that these babies had a change from at about 48 to 72 hours where their plasma glucose concentration increased up to normal adult values. But in those first five days, 39% of those babies had one or more plasma glucose concentrations that were below 2.6 millimoles per litre or how we define hypoglycemia. So Deb also did a survey looking at which babies we screen in Australia and New Zealand. And she found that we screen, that just about everybody would screen the infants of the diabetics and growth restricted babies, 
um, large for gestational age babies and preterm babies, and that that also screens symptomatic babies, so babies who aren't feeding well or who are unwell. And this is similar to the guideline from the American Academy of Pediatrics, who also recommend screening late preterm babies, small for gestational age babies, babies of diabetic mothers, and large for gestational age babies. We don't know what proportion of the babies on the postnatal ward this is, but depending on how you define small for gestational age and large for gestational age, this could be as high as 30%. Um, because if you define small for gestational age as less than the 10th percentile and large for gestational age is greater than the 90th percentile, that's 20% of babies. Diabetics are becoming more common as more women develop gestational diabetes in pregnancy and late preterm babies make up a substantial proportion of the preterm babies. So that's a lot of babies that we are screening for neonatal hypoglycemia. And how good is the evidence for screening? Well, it's not great. As Chris said, one of the problems with screening for neonatal hypoglycemia is that we don't have a gold standard. We don't have a test that tells us what's actually happening at the neuronal level. And screening for neonatal hypoglycemia does not meet several of the principles for a screening test. So neurodevelopmental outcomes of transient neonatal hypoglycemia are not well understood. And importantly, there's no evidence that treatment actually improves these outcomes. This is some more data from the child study that Chris mentioned before. And I've put this up to show that what we do know about screening is that for babies who are screened and who are treated to keep their blood glucose concentration at 2.6 millimoles per litre or more, then they have no difference in their incidence of neurosensory impairment compared to babies who didn't develop hypoglycemia. So the current screening and treatment strategy seems to preserve cognitive function. However, as Chris mentioned from the child study, there is this concern that with children who were hypoglycemic and treated with dextrose, those who develop neurosensory impairment were more likely to have higher sugars, interstitial sugars, in the first 12 hours after birth. And that raises the question, is screening and treatment of these babies actually doing harm? And the other way that screening could potentially be doing harm is um, when we look at the rates of exclusive breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is lower in babies who are at risk of hypoglycemia. And some of that may be due to the fact that the conditions that put these babies at risk, such as the mothers having diabetes or boy, being born late preterm, are associated with lower breastfeeding rates. But some of it may also be due to the fact that we treat these babies with formula, which reduces breastfeeding. And we also may make the mothers lose confidence in their own ability to feed their baby, which could contribute to lower breastfeeding rates later on. And this is from the four and a half year follow-up of the child study, as Chris showed us before. And I've put this here just to emphasize that even though we think that 2.6 as a treatment threshold for screening is sufficient to maintain um, neurosensory cognitive function, we are concerned that there are higher rates of visual motor difficulty and executive function with more severe or more frequent episodes of hypoglycemia, which raises the question, is the screening and treatment at babies at 2.6 millimoles per litre enough? We did a couple of audits looking at adherence to our guideline for hypoglycemia. And we first did the audit in 2011. Um, we're a bit horrified with the results, so made some changes to our practice and repeated the audit in 2015. And what we found was that for babies who are at risk of hypoglycemia and therefore from our guideline needed to be screened, only 50% of them were receiving any screening. And we managed to improve that to 80% four years later. But adherence, which we defined as having any blood glucose um, screening, having the first blood glucose concentration one to two hours after the baby was born, and having three normal blood glucose concentrations before stopping screening, um, was initially 30% and then rose to 50%. And you can see that 
we were only um, managing to do the first blood sugar within the first one to two hours after birth um, in just under 60% of babies, and that didn't really improve. But once we did start screening babies, then we were reasonably good at keeping on screening and treating them until we had three blood glucose concentrations that were 2.6 millimoles or above. And when we look at the different risk factor groups, we were very good at recognising that infants of diabetic mothers needed to be screened for hypoglycemia, not so good at being adherent to the guideline. We were poor at picking up that babies born late preterm needed to be screened. And when we actually looked at the guideline, we found that we hadn't actually included late preterm as a group that needed to be screened. So we add that into the guideline and those rates improved. Adherence was pretty low though. And small for gestational age and large for gestational age, which need to be picked up based on weight percentiles around the time of birth, were very poor at being picked up. And this managed to improve when we used automatically calculated weight centiles on the hospital um, database and put those numbers automatically onto the newborn record for the carer to be aware of with a great improvement of screening for these babies. So what we currently do is identify the babies who are at risk, monitor their pre-feed blood glucose concentrations, make sure they're fed, um, breastfeed them, give them EBM, so express breast milk, dextrose gel and formula, or formula. And then if that doesn't work, then we admit them to NICU um, or SCABU. But we still are not sure once we have diagnosed these babies with hypoglycemia, what blood glucose concentration should we be targeting? And this was a, a randomized controlled trial that was published recently, which randomized hypoglycemic babies, so babies with a plasma glucose concentration of 2 to 2.5 millimoles per litre um, on the postnatal wards. And they were randomized to either what we usually do, so what they called intensive monitoring, aiming to keep the glucose concentration greater than or equal to 2.6 millimoles per litre, or expectant monitoring, aiming to keep the plasma glucose concentration greater than or equal to 2 millimoles per litre. Um, and this was a non-inferiority study design. So wanting to see if the expectant monitoring was not inferior to the intensive monitoring. And what they found was that, as you might expect, the babies in the intensive treatment group needed to have more feeding, more um, enteral tube feeding, and more intravenous glucose in order to keep those plasma glucose concentrations higher. And they did manage to keep them higher. They were 0.24 of a millimeter, millimole per litre higher than the babies in the um, other group that was aiming to keep the plasma glucose concentration at two millimoles per litre or higher. And they had less hypoglycemic episodes. And their primary outcome was um, develop, neurodevelopment measured by the Baileys 3. And what they found was that at 18 months of age, there was no difference um, in their developmental outcome between the two groups, the group where they maintain the plasma glucose concentration greater than or equal to two, the intensive monitoring, or the expected monitoring where they kept the plasma glucose concentration at greater than or equal to two. Although what we now need to see is further follow-up of these children to see if these that this remains reassuring as the children get older, and especially if there are any effects on the children's visual motor function or executive function. Deb Harris um, also did a sub-analysis of the children who were in the Sugar Babies trial, which is a trial of dextrose gel to treat neonatal hypoglycemia. And she wanted to know for children in this trial who became hypoglycemic, was how, what elements of how they were fed and treated actually increased their blood glucose concentration. And what she found was that oral dextrose gel to treat hypoglycemia increased the blood glucose concentration, and that if they were given formula, that also increased the blood glucose concentration. But she didn't see any effect of expressed breast milk on the blood glucose concentration or of breastfeeding. However, 
breastfeeding was associated with a reduced requirement for repeat uh, dextrose gel treatment. And that just, I think, emphasises that there is more to breast milk um, and more to breastfeeding than just providing breast milk um, and the release of gut hormones and other things that help the baby transition um, to feeding and metabolising normally. So oral dextrose gel has been used for diabetics with hypoglycemia for a long time. And there were two small observational studies in the early 1990s which demonstrated an improvement in the blood glucose concentration in hypoglycemic babies. The first randomised trial was done um, in 2000, only published as an abstract, but didn't see any difference between hypoglycemic babies treated with oral dextrose gel and those who did not receive dextrose gel. The Sugar Babies uh, trial was published a few years ago now in The Lancet. And that looked at hypoglycemic babies, and they were randomized to either treatment with 200 milligrams per kilo of oligodextrose gel or placebo. And the primary outcome was treatment failure. And what they found was that dextrose gel was more effective than placebo in reducing treatment failure, reducing NICU admission rates for hypoglycemia, reducing maternal infant separation, and it also increased breastfeeding at two weeks of age. And in fact, it saved money. So the in-hospital costs of treating one baby with hypoglycemia were less than standard care. And this is um, mostly due to the fact that these babies didn't need to be admitted to NICU for hypoglycemia as often. So part of the treatment cycle is that when we have um, effective care from a randomized trial, we should do a systematic review and then put the evidence from that systematic review into a clinical practice guideline, which we should then implement. So the Cochrane systematic review was done, which looked at oral dextrose gel for the treatment of neonatal hypoglycemia. And the recommendation was that this should be considered the first line treatment for infants with neonatal hypoglycemia. So we developed a clinical practice guideline in New Zealand and the key recommendation of this guideline that was babies diagnosed with neonatal hypoglycemia, we should treat them with 40% dextrose gel. And we developed an algorithm for which babies should be um, treated with dextrose gel, which babies should be referred for ur urgent medical review, and when a repeat blood glucose concentration should be done. And that guideline has now been implemented in New Zealand. But if oral dextrose gel doesn't work, then the next step is for babies to be admitted to the NICU. And what we automatically do then is start them on intravenous dextrose. But there's actually not much evidence at all to support the use of intravenous dextrose. This is an observational study which did frequent um, plasma glucose concentrations in hypoglycemic babies. This figures from small for gestational age babies. Um, and what happened to the sugars after they were starting on intravenous dextrose. So you can see that there is a rapid rise in the plasma glucose concentration in most babies when they are started on dextrose, but no randomized evidence and no long-term data. Diazoxide is a treatment of great interest because it actually um, works to solve the problem so that it reduces insulin secretion from the beta cell. And for most of these babies, as Chris was saying, um, they have increased insulin secretion. That's what's causing the problem. This, um, there isn't a lot of evidence for diazoxide, but there is this randomized control trial that randomized small babies uh, with hypoglycemia to receive diazoxide or, or placebo, and found that the blood glucose stabilized quicker in the babies treated with the diazoxide. Glucagon um, is the other option, a very reassuring option because it can be given intramuscularly when um, intravenous access is a problem and can also be given as an intravenous infusion. Only observational data, but in this observational study, they showed that a glucagon infusion increased the blood glucose concentration um, significantly after babies were started on a glucagon infusion. So in summary, we've talked about screening and how a large proportion of babies on their postnatal wards actually meet the criteria to be screened for hypoglycemia. 
but we don't actually have a good amount of evidence um, for screening. And then we talked about some of the treatment options, and there's actually not a lot of good evidence to guide us on what treatment we should be providing for neonatal hypoglycemia. So now I'll hand over to Professor Harding to talk to us about how we can prevent hypoglycemia happening in the first place. Hello, and it's a pleasure to talk to you now for a few minutes, having talked about treatment causes and treatment, we now talk about prevention of hypoglycemia. And the first question is, why would you bother to prevent it? Mostly because the things we do to treat hypoglycemia are problematic, as we've just reviewed. You often includes infant formula, admission to NICU, separating mothers and babies, interfering with breastfeeding, and it's expensive. So ideally, we'd like something that would prevent all of that stuff, that would avoid those adverse effects of treating hypoglycemia. And ideally, it would be inexpensive and possibly even cost saving. A second reason we might consider prevention is that we're actually not very good at treating it. This is from the child study again that Dr. McKinley spoke to you about. Children who were at risk of hypoglycemia and were treated to, in an attempt to maintain glucose as above 2.6 or 47 milligrams per deciliter, in their continuous monitoring, what it showed us was that although half of these babies experienced a low blood glucose, a quarter had an interstitial glucose concentration that was low, not detected on intermittent blood testing. And in fact, a quarter of them had a low glucose for more than five hours in the first week, even though they were all being screened and treated in an attempt on intermittent glucose testing to maintain their glucose above that. So, Another reason for prevention is actually we're not very good at treating it. There's lots of undetected low glucose levels. And the child study showed us that those undetected low glucose levels are associated with a higher ri risk of poor executive function at four and a half. So they may have some neurocognitive consequences. And Dr. McKinley also referred to this study, the Kaiser study, where children not at risk, just all comers at a single blood glucose concentration below the different thresholds along the top were treated or not, but just one low glucose below that threshold was associated with a reduced odds of being of achieving at expected levels in literacy and maths at 10 years of age. So these two studies together suggest that it's possible that just one low blood glucose that we detect might be one too many. And if that's the case, the best treatment in the world is not going to optimize outcomes. And we need to think about prevention. So what are the options for preventing hypoglycemia? These are the ones that have been tried. And I'll go through them briefly. Skin to skin contact may reduce hypoglycemia, mostly through improved thermoregulation and therefore lower metabolic demand. There is some evidence from before and after trials and comparative trials, of small improvements in glucose concentration and NICU admission. But skin to skin contact, early skin to skin contact is recommended best practice anyway. So there's no reason not to be using this and it may have a small benefit for hypoglycemia. Likewise, early breastfeeding. Colostrum on the first days after birth actually contains very few calories but lots of other good things. And as Dr. Ellswell has just pointed out, breastfeeding is associated with reduced persistent hypoglycemia, even though there's not much calories. The evidence on whether feeding in the first hour does or does not improve glucose concentration is actually conflicting. There are studies saying it does, studies say it doesn't. And there is the study that Dr. Ellswell showed you showing that giving breast milk on, sorry, we haven't published this study yet, but we have shown that babies who are breastfed, interstitial glucose concentrations don't change after a feed on day one. Probably again, because of this immature metabolic function that takes time for the insulin glucose access to be working properly. 
But again, early breastfeeding is recommended breast fat, best practice. And there's no reason why one wouldn't use it regardless in babies at risk. There is much more convincing evidence that antenatal breast milk expression does not help. The rationale is, of course, that if you encourage women known to be likely to have a baby at risk of hypoglycemia to express before the birth, she's more likely to have breast milk available to feed the baby and perhaps breast milk might come in earlier and the baby might feed better and you might reduce formula use. But the randomized trial, the DANE trial, that randomized women with diabetes to antenatal breast milk expression or not clearly showed that it made absolutely no difference to neonatal hypoglycemia. And giving expressed breast milk to hypoglycemic infants in the first couple of days after birth doesn't improve their glucose concentration. So I think we can be reasonably confident that this is not a good approach to preventing hypoglycemia. Supplementary feeding is, of course, common. It certainly provides known calories, but it's a problem for supporting breastfeeding. There have been a couple of randomized trials providing sugar as a sucrose solution that show that it's not any better than feeding alone in babies at risk. And we could talk about why that is, but it's not surprising. And there have been a couple of trials that shown in hypoglycemic babies given formula that giving formula plus sugar is better than just giving formula to treat them but again we're not really wanting for prevention to be giving powdered sugar and formula to all babies what about oral dextrose gel when we started thinking about this a few years ago the rationale was well it's very effective in treating hypoglycemia it's safe it's inexpensive it supports breastfeeding could we use it for prevention? And that led us to the HPOD trial, um, which is really a study in three stages. Firstly, is there a dose of gel that might reduce hypoglycemia? We did a dosage trial, 400 babies, randomized to eight different dosage arms. This is Joe Hegarty who led this trial. And the short answer is a single to any dose of dextrose gel did reduce hypoglycemia by about 20% and also looked promising for keeping babies out of NICU. So that led us to the HPOD trial. Could we use this prevention to treat, but to prevent babies getting to NICU? Large study, 2000 babies over five years. We used the optimal dose from the dosage trial and the short answer from this study, which was published early this year, is that a single dose of dextrose gel at one hour of age did not keep babies out of NICU. We think that's probably because the babies at risk are actually going to NICU for other reasons. But it did reduce the incidence of hypoglycemia and it did improve the first blood glucose concentration. But of course, the whole reason for prevention and treatment of hypoglycemia is to improve developmental outcomes. So we're currently in the process of looking at the developmental outcomes for these children. I can show we've just finished the two year follow up of about 1300 babies. The two year follow up of the dosage trial, the first trial has been published and showed earlier this year that there was a promising trend towards improved language scores and improved executive function in two-year-olds who received the dextrose gel prophylaxis in different doses. And the Cochrane review of prophylaxis, which has just been published, suggests that if we gave prophylactic dextrose gel to 100 at-risk babies, we might prevent six cases of hypo hypoglycemia, four cases of major disability, and have no adverse effects recommends that people should now be thinking about whether we should introduce prophylactic dextrose gel into clinical practice. So what we, should we be doing to babies at risk to prevent hypoglycemia? We should be using skin to skin contact and early breastfeeding because those are good things to do, not because there's strong evidence that they reduce hypoglycemia, but they may.
We can be reasonably confident that antenatal breast milk expression, supplementary feeding and adding sugar are not helpful, but that dextrose gel probably is. And I'd like to thank all the people who do the work and close our part of the, of the presentation to hear from questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we do have some questions, so we'll just get right to them. Um, the first one is, if glucose is fundamental for all cellular metabolism, especially in neurons, why did you only find visual function and executive function impaired? Why not all neurodevelopmental and cognitive functions? Chris, do you want to pick that up? Um, it's a fascinating question. Um, I think the answer is that different parts of the brain um, can extract glucose preferentially from the blood. Um, and there's probably different metabolic states. It's thought that those, particularly the occipital parietal areas of the brain are more metabolically active in the newborn. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting that those areas affected are not deeper parts of the brain, such as the basal ganglia, which would are often injured in hypoxic ischemic injury, whereas they're able to extract glucose uh, much better from the blood. So I think I think it's related to the, the glucose uptake and use primarily. Okay, next question. Mother on labet labetalol for pregnancy-induced hypertension and postnatally baby noted to have hypoglycemia. Can someone explain the, me the mechanism behind this cause of hypoglycemia? Jane, do you want to pick that? Don't know the answer. Does anyone else know the answer? <laughs> I think it's because the the beta blockers suppress gluconeogenesis, is, is my understanding. Um, and that's certainly a risk. And while we've talked about um, the key clinical risks in terms of large, small babies, preterm, et cetera, there are a long list of minor risk factors and one of those is maternal uh, medications and beta blockers are particularly um, important in that class in the same way that if you have to treat a baby with a beta blocker for example for a, a mangioma you would be monitoring um, blood glucose okay have you determined actual iugr in sga and aga infants to help sort out whether it is iugr and not just being a small infant for example from a short mother as the problem since you indicated that it was iugr in the fetus that predisposed to neonatal hypoglycemia i think that's a good question but i think um most of the studies have been done on sga rather than growth restriction because SGA is much easier to define after the baby's born than growth restriction is. Um, so I suspect that you're probably right that it's babies who have not reached their growth potential where something has um, interfered during the pregnancy that are at higher risk than babies who are, say, on the ninth percentile because they are genetically supposed to be on the ninth percentile. But I don't know that we have the evidence to support that. Okay. Um, the next one is AAP glucose greater than 45 milligrams per deciliter, New Zealand greater than 47 milligrams per deciliter, PES greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter. The variability in measurements and PHHCT affecting POC measurements and different guidelines, doesn't it seem like arguing these levels is not evidence-based? I, 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 well, I agree that we don't know what the right level is. I think the studies that we have been talking about have all been done on accurate glucose oxidase or lab-based methods. They're not the inaccurate point of care methods, so they're much less affected by those problems. But we don't know what the right threshold is for the reasons that Chris was elucidating earlier. Do you want to add to that, Chris? Yeah, um, those, those minor differences in the, whether it's 45, 46, 47, are just rounding between international units and milligrams per deciliter. Um, so I think, you know, the, the threshold we're talking about is somewhere 2.5 to 2.7. Um, we use 2.6. And I think for the reasons I've explained, 
we're never going to have a magic number that tells us all these babies are safe uh, and all these babies are at risk. And, and that's because of the very indirect relationship between the blood glucose and what happens in the brain. But also because all of these studies, um, you know, that we're talking about in terms of cohorts are comparing exposed infants who are treated to some degree, um, but we don't know whether that treatment is necessarily beneficial. So I think the best we can do is have an operational threshold and we have to keep on working towards an operational threshold that achieves the best balance between preventing injury, achieving benefit, but avoiding um, potential harms and also that's you know cost effective. Are you possibly recommending diazoxide in usual hypoglycemic infants, not just for infants with hyperinsulin genetic disorders in severely affected infants when this drug has serious side effects, including pulmonary hypertension and death and usually requires a diuretic? Uh, so what I'm, Chris Sketch, I know he's got a big interest in it, but um, my slide was more about um, this is an area that needs more research rather than saying that that's what we should do at the moment. Um, but I'll let Chris answer. Um, I, I think we have to be very cautious about any new approaches to um, treating hyperglycemia. Um, diazoxide does have some risks, but they have been um, mostly in, in babies who have been on higher doses and long-term treatment with genetic um, disorders relating to insulin secretion. However, the, the trial that Jane Oswheeler showed uh, from India um, was promising and we're currently halfway through um, a study to address exactly that question where the early use of diazoxide in babies that um, fail first line measures such as dextrose gel um, would achieve um, shorter admissions, improve feeding um, and glucose stability. We're halfway through that study. What I can say at the moment is that we've seen no um, adverse, events, adverse events in, in 40 infants randomized so far. Okay. Can you comment on any additives in dextrose gel? Um, yes, there's a whole bunch of different versions of dextrose gel available commercially. They are mostly produced for use in diabetics. A lot of them have different additives and preservatives and flavorings and colorings in them. Um, I think for neonatal use, you need to read the label carefully and decide if the preservatives and additives are acceptable. And also to check that there is not, that the content is only dextrose because quite a lot of them have other carbohydrates in them as well. And the whole principle of using dextrose gel is that it can be absorbed directly through the buccal mucosa. If you add other carbohydrates, they're going to compete for uptake and they actually might inhibit the effect of the dextrose gel. So the one the product we use is manufactured specifically for this purpose. But in any case, any 40% dextrose gel will work. It's a matter of whether you can cope with whatever else is in it and hunting for one that's available to you that has acceptable additives. Are there any population-based longitudinal epidemiological studies, corrected or confounding variables, that have shown any change in incidence or hypoglycemia-related cognitive defects? Another way of asking this is, have all of the changes we are making with changing thresholds and treatments made any difference? I'm not aware of any such study. I don't know if any of the others are. Good question. No, I mean, from our from our systematic review meta-analysis, you know, we found 11 studies um, and really we're basing all our evidence on, at the most, uh, you know, less than a thousand babies, um, observational data, only a few of them have good prospective um, collection of information on confounders, most of them are not adjusted. Um, so there's definitely associations. Um, We've all seen in our practice cases, you know, of severe profound hyperglycemia leading to poor outcome. We know it can happen. We don't know where that threshold sits in terms of the average asymptomatic baby with hyperglycemia. Okay, great. 
Well, we're right at time. I want to thank you all so much for all your insights. Um, thank you to our attendees for coming to see us and come back and see us on July 8th for our next webinar. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye.